The most famous death in history is the death of Jesus of Nazareth. 2,000 years ago, in first century Jerusalem, he was crucified by the Romans. The Gospels tell us he was buried in a tomb. And two days later, Mary Magdalene, one of his closest disciples, found the tomb empty. But according to the Gospel of Matthew, there was another story circulating after Jesus' death. And though the Gospel calls it a lie, it was rumored that Jesus' disciples secretly took their master's body, presumably to give him a permanent burial. If this is true, according to first century burial practices in Jerusalem, Jesus' body would have been taken to a rock-hewn family tomb. Given that he was crucified for insurrection, the reburial would have been done in secret by his closest disciples. Jesus' body would have been shrouded and left to decompose. One year later, his disciples would have returned, this time joined by his family for the final burial ceremony. Mary, Jesus' mother, would have attended the ceremony. Mary Magdalene would also have been there. His brothers, Simon, Joseph, Judah, and James would have prepared Jesus' bones for the final burial, placing them in a limestone coffin called an ossuary. Jesus' name would have been inscribed on the side. His ossuary would then have been placed in a niche in the inner chamber, sealed away forever, deep inside his family tomb. שישי לקראת צהריים, ממש מול החלום של הבית, זה היה אתר בנייה שהתחילו לבנות אותו. כדי לבנות היו עושים פיצוצים בהר, היו מפוצצים דינמית את ההר, ואז בתור ילדים, מסקרנות רצנו לראות מה קורה ואיפה זה. ואחרי שהיה את הפיצוץ וכל האבק שקע, מה שראיתי בעצם מרחוק בהר, ראיתי את איזה מערת קבורה, יש לה משולש עם העיגול. In the spring of 1980, in Tel Piot, South Jerusalem, construction blasting exposed the entrance to a burial tomb. It was 2,000 years old. My son was coming. He was coming to Ritsa. He was the mother. The boys wanted to get rid of the grave of the grave. אז התחלתי להתקשר לכל מיני ארכיאולוגים שחיפשתי דרך הטלפון וזה כמעט לא היה אף אחד. המשטרה, כדי לעצור את הפיצוצים, העובדים הלכו הביתה, כי גם זה היה אחד. On the Sunday morning, under pressure from contractors, a team of archaeologists was called in to excavate. They had only three days before the tomb was to be sealed and cemented over. I could see this uh, large slope with uh, tractors and, and bulldozers and trucks uh, trundling in different directions. And right in the center of this uh, slope was this gaping hole, which turned out to be the entrance to the Talpiot uh, tomb. Above the entrance was a unique facade, a carefully crafted chevron and circle that mystified the archaeologists. There's no doubt about it that uh, those symbols which are on the facades of the Talpiot tomb meant something. It's unlikely that the person or the family that came to carve out the tomb just uh, carved these things at random. They had to symbolize uh, uh, something. What they symbolize, I don't know. But it's quite rare to find that kind of ornamentation on a simple tomb. 
Shimon Gibson, a young surveyor at the time, was one of the first inside. It was his job to record the layout. It was great. It was very exciting. Me entering into the tomb, which has been cut into, into rock. It has a central chamber. It has arcosolia benches in the walls for the laying out of uh, bodies. It has um, these loculi extending in different directions. It was incredibly important to get as much archaeological detail as possible onto plans. Gibson's detailed plan recorded every inch of the tomb's interior. Extending out from a large inner chamber were six deep cavities called loculi, or kohim in Hebrew. And inside these kohim, the archaeologists found 10 small limestone coffins, also called ossuaries. The ossuaries were quickly transferred to Jerusalem's Rockefeller Museum under the direction of the Israel Department of Antiquities. The bones and remains found inside were bagged and boxed and put aside for reburial. Certain decisions were made by the Israel Antiquities Authority that they would heed to the requests of the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Jerusalem and give over um, bone material which had been analyzed and, and uh, examined by anthropologists for reburial. And then they began the process of cataloging the ancient bone boxes. By 1980, over 1,000 ossuaries had been found, but only 20% of them bore the names of the dead. Here, it was discovered that six out of the 10 ossuaries had inscriptions. They are not monumental inscriptions. They're not intended to uh, be seen and viewed by everybody, and they're not there to commemorate the dead. They are there so that when family members come in and start shifting the uh, boxes around so they can put a new one in, they know which one is which and which belongs to who. The archaeological record shows that the custom of using ossuaries for burial in Jerusalem only lasted for about 100 years, ending around 70 of the Common Era when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. And so the discovery of inscriptions on stone coffins like these provide archaeologists with a catalogue of names specific to the time of Jesus. And on one of the ossuaries discovered in the Talpiot tomb, written in Aramaic, was an astonishing name. Yeshua Bar. Yosef. Yeshua, or Jesus, son of Joseph. Yeshua bar Yosef. Now, when this was found, uh, I think the archaeologists weren't too excited about it. The public would have been very excited, but they didn't hear about it. You found a Jesus, son of Joseph, ossuary? But it wasn't really talked about. Today, the Jesus Son of Joseph ossuary is in the hands of the Israel Antiquities Authority, or IAA, as are the rest of the stone coffins taken from the Talpiot tomb. Most of them have been locked away and stored in this massive warehouse. But why? We've assembled a team of scientists, scholars, and journalists to investigate the 10 ancient bone boxes and to find out why they've been ignored. This, this is it. Felix? Yeah. This one is five for three. This is it. This is it. Jesus, son of Joseph. Today, it takes an expert in ancient writing like world renowned Harvard professor Frank Moore Cross to examine the inscription. Because even though it is one of the plainest ever found on an ossuary, its letters are so informal that it's very difficult to read. This being quite informal, and this particular one quite messy. Academics describe it as a graffiti, so cursory it's almost as if it was meant to be read only by intimate family. 
there's an X here before the name. And then the name Yeshua, then the, the Father's name, is perfectly clear, Yehoseph, the son of Joseph. I have no real doubt that this is to be read Yeshua, and then Yeshua bar Yehoseph, that is Jesus, son of Joseph. Jesus, son of Joseph. Professor Cross's examination of the photograph has now shown us exactly what to look for on the actual coffin. Yud Vav Shin Ein. Yud Shin Vav Ein. Jesus. Bet Resh Son of Yud He Vav Samach Pe Joseph. <laughs> Jesus, Son of Joseph. It's quite amazing, right? Eh? Amazing is not, not the word for it. Can this stone coffin be linked to Jesus of Nazareth? To answer that question, we have to examine all the archaeological evidence uncovered in this family tomb. Does it fit with Christian tradition? Does it challenge certain articles of faith? If the bones of Jesus were to be found in an ossuary in Jerusalem tomorrow, and without doubt, let's say, they are definitely agreed to be the bones of Jesus, would that destroy Christian faith? It certainly would not destroy my Christian faith. I leave what happens to bodies up to God. It seems that Christians can accept the possibility that the remains of Jesus were transferred to a family tomb. Thereafter, he could have risen and appeared to his followers as the Gospels report. According to Christian faith, Jesus then ascended to heaven. In theory, the ascension could have been spiritual, leaving his body behind. In fact, those who take a strictly historical approach to the Gospels would expect to find Jesus' remains in his family tomb. When he's first buried, it's in a temporary tomb. And later, unless he somehow magically disappears and goes to heaven, which is a position of Christian faith, but if you're going to be historical and realistic, uh, he, he was put in a, would be put in a permanent place, a permanent place of burial as a good Jew, okay? Well, the tomb, you have to have a family tomb. The family tomb of Jesus. If the ossuary found in the Talpia tomb, marked Jesus, son of Joseph, did at one time contain the mortal remains of Jesus, then all the ossuaries in that tomb would have to belong to members of the Jesus family. On the other five ossuaries reported to have inscriptions, we should only expect to find names from the family tree of Jesus. Jesus was the son of Mary and Joseph. But what many people don't know is that according to Christian tradition, he had two sisters, Miriam and Salome. And the Gospel of Matthew tells us he had four brothers, Simon, Judah, James, and Joseph. His adoptive father, Joseph, was descended from King David. But Joseph most likely died in Nazareth and would have been buried there, not in Jerusalem. Jesus' mother Mary, Maria in antiquity, was also of Davidic descent. But unlike Joseph, according to later Christian tradition, she died in Jerusalem. And within the same tomb as Jesus, son of Joseph, a second name was discovered. First of all, it's an ossuary found in Jerusalem. The ossuary is now housed in the basement of the Israel Museum. As you can see, the script is very simple. The Hebrew letters that create this name are Mem, Mem is for M, Reish, like R, Yud can be I or Y, and He in Hebrew, it's like H in Latin, English. That makes Maria. Maria. 
and it's one of the rare examples of that name on Oshuari in Israel. Maria, Mary, found in the same family tomb as Jesus, son of Joseph. Could this be the Virgin Mary's ossuary? Throughout history, from the first Greek writings of Mark, the earliest gospel, the Virgin Mary's name has come down to us in only one form, Maria. It is a Latinized version of the Hebrew, Miriam. After Jesus' death, Mary continued with his teachings and must have gathered a large following. In those times of religious transition, Roman converts also began to follow Jesus. And so as her popularity grew amongst his followers, Mary's name was Latinized. That is why the New Testament records her name as Maria. Written in Hebrew, the name Maria is very rare but it's exactly what was found on the ossuary in the Talpia tomb. If in 1980, archaeologists had considered, even for a moment, that they had discovered the ossuary of the Virgin Mary, what other family members might they have expected to find next to her? Look, Matthew, Matthew. M T U D H. So Matya. Matya, which is a short form, a nickname, if you wish, uh, of Matitya or Matityahu, which is where we in English got the uh, name Matthew. Matthew. The name, at first, doesn't seem to fit with the Jesus family. The New Testament is made up of the writings of four Gospels attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, the evangelist, was a disciple of Jesus, but scholars don't believe he was a blood member of his family. However, there is reason to believe that there were many Matthews within the Jesus family. I'll tell you something very interesting. There are two genealogies of Jesus. Everybody reads the formal genealogy of Joseph, his adoptive father. It's basically all the kings of Israel and on down, well-known, great historic names. But the uh, other genealogy is embedded in Luke. Uh, people don't notice it much. It's Luke chapter three. You gotta turn a few pages. It's Mary's genealogy, the mother. And in her genealogy, guess what? You have five, six, seven, eight Matthews. Mattia, Matthias. It's a Maccabean, Hashmonean name. It's a fierce name of a sort of a kingly family. It's a priestly name. You remember, Mary is related to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, who's a priest. So she's got some priestly connections there, as well as Judah, which is the tribe of the Davidic Messiah. So I don't think it's odd that we would have a Matthew in, in this tomb at all. In fact, it's sort of one more congruence and fitting together. In fact, unlike Matthew, many biblical names like Isaac or Jonah would have virtually disqualified the tomb as the Jesus family tomb because they do not appear anywhere in Jesus' genealogy. There isn't a single name that doesn't fit the gospel story. Each name in the same tomb connects. Every single one of these names is gospel related. There isn't like any name like Daniel or something else. It just doesn't fit. On three ossuaries, four names have been uncovered. Joseph, Jesus, Mary, and Matthew. And then on an ossuary found deep within the tomb, another name was discovered. This inscription says Yossa, with a hey in the end. Um, it's, a, it's a diminutive of Yosef. There is uh, no question about it. As an ossuary inscription, this would probably be quite unusual. If I'm publishing in English, I say, oh, okay, there's a, a Joseph. Well, it's not just a Joseph. It's Yosei. Now, 
in Hebrew, Yossi in Israel today is quite common. Yossi, Yossi, Joseph, like Joey. But Yose, you will never hear. And you didn't hear it in the ancient world either. The Yod, the E becomes a A, Yose. Guess where we know that name? In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has a brother. People don't all know that Jesus had brothers. Most scholars, you know, the Roman Catholic Church says they were cousins and other people, they were stepbrothers. But most of the historians and the biblical scholars have pretty well now admitted that Jesus had brothers. They're named in the Gospels, the four brothers, James, Joseph, Jude, and Simon. But the Joseph in Mark, only in Mark, our earliest Gospel, is not Joseph. It's Yose. Yose, or Josie in the English, was the brother of Jesus. But the Gospels don't tell us much more than that. He disappears after three brief citations. What happened to Yose is a mystery. But if the ossuaries from the Talpiot tomb belong to the Jesus family, then Yose has finally been found. Of all the ossuary inscriptions ever discovered, there is only one with this unique spelling of the nickname Yose. Look, it's clear as day, it's Josie. And that's an incredible thing because according to Jewish law, if someone has a nickname, you have to put their nickname on their tombstone or casket. And it's the nickname that appears here right next to Jesus, son of Joseph. The brother was known as Josie, not Joseph, and it's exactly in the same configuration right here. Josie, Yossa. In 1980, archaeologists were cataloging ossuary names in lists of hundreds. And from this tomb, they now had Jose, a rare nickname given to the brother of Jesus. Maria a rare Latinized version of Mary used in the Gospels to refer to Jesus' mother. Matia, a version of Matthew that, as it happens, was common in Mary's family. And Jesus, son of Joseph. All found together in a family tomb, all cleaned and cataloged, all bone material reburied, together, here in an especially consecrated grave outside Jerusalem. All the ossuaries were then crated and stored for decades on warehouse shelves. Why didn't anyone take notice of these names? You gotta remember that the 1970s um, and the, the early 1980s was the boom period for the excavation of tombs in and around Jerusalem. So there was suddenly enormous quantities of osseries being brought back to the, the Rockefeller Museum, the headquarters of the Israel Department of Antiquities. And these um, inscriptions were deemed to be common. These are the most common names among Jews in the first century common era. These are exceedingly uh, uh, popular names in the period. All the facts that we have is that there is a cluster of names that resemble many of the names that we find in the New Testament. The other fact is that we find these names in many other places. So suggesting that this tomb was the tomb of the family of Jesus is a far-fetched suggestion, and we need to be very careful with that. You know, all the tombs around Jerusalem unfortunately with construction, are slowly getting exposed and in some cases destroyed. So it's not so far-fetched that a construction crew would have uncovered the tomb of Jesus, you know? I mean, it can happen. I think we have to consider it. While the statistical probabilities have been argued, they have never been examined by statistical experts until now. Andre Feuerberger, is a professor of mathematics and statistics. From ossuaries and other sources, he's gathered every name known from the time of Jesus. By noting how often each name occurs, he can statistically evaluate the names discovered in Talpiot. One of the things that's fairly interesting about this particular tomb site is that from a lay point of view, 
if one looks at the specific names that occur in the cluster, and if one focuses just on the names individually, uh, one can very well come away with the impression that uh, there is nothing the least bit unusual about this particular cluster. But the correct way to analyze this is to look at all of the names in unison. According to statistics, if we were on a crowded street in ancient Jerusalem and called out the name Jesus, 4% of the men would most probably answer. If we were to call out the name Mary, 25% of the women would probably respond. They were both common names. But what Feuerberger explains is that if we were to call out for a Jesus with a father called Joseph, a mother named Mary, and a brother called Jose, the odds that such an individual would respond are quite low. From a statistical point of view, we don't actually look at the incidences of the individual names uh, where we say that each one of them is a very common name. We look at the way in which the factors combine with each other. So sure, a father by the name of Joseph is not a rare name. A son by the name of Yeshua is not a rare name. But when you combine those two together, it's rarer. So it really is a possibility that this particular tomb site is in fact the one of the New Testament family. It is a possibility that I think needs to be taken seriously. Taking the possibility seriously means that we must try to uncover more evidence. And one way to do that is to find the Talpian tomb. But more than 25 years ago, the tomb was reburied, sealed, and cemented over. A huge complex of apartments was built on top. Even if the tomb can be located, it may well be impossible to get into it, sitting under meters of concrete and foundation. Poring over architectural plans decades old and cross-referencing the IAA archaeology reports, our team believes they've discovered the underground location of the Talpiot tomb. The Talpiot site is perfectly situated halfway between ancient Jerusalem and Bethlehem, the two cities most important to Jesus and his family. It would have been an ideal location for his family tomb, considering that surviving members would have traveled from both cities to visit the burial site. If you think about it, it's perfect. It's right between Jerusalem over there, where Itai is, and Bethlehem is over there. This is where, if I was a member of the Jesus family, this is where I would want to be buried, okay? okay? So we know that there's a tomb right over here, right? Our research shows that in 1980, two tombs were discovered on the Talpiot site. The roof of the second tomb had been partially destroyed by construction, but it was sealed up again and not excavated because of time constraints and pressure from religious groups to keep it undisturbed. The archaeological reports show that this second tomb is 20 meters north of tomb number one. The apartment blueprints show that tomb number one is located under a patio and beside a bedroom wall. This, we believe, is the tomb we're looking for. Now, we know that one of the tombs is under the patio. We know that there's pipes coming out. That's where you come in. There's some potential. Crude IAA sketches suggest that both tombs may have had access pipes installed before building continued above them. It's common for pipes like these to be added at the request of rabbis, in response to the orthodox belief that spirits need a clear passage from a tomb. We're gonna go down however many feet it is until we hit bottom. I mean, once, once we're down there, if the drawing is accurate and we've got that curve in that pipe, the camera's gonna go down the curve, we're gonna see what's there. My concern is that those pipes are bogus, that whoever built it just built pipes there to make rabbis happy. Oh yeah, the souls can move and there's nothing there. Ideally, you stick your camera down that thing. Yes. Confirm that there is a tomb, that there's a space in between the tomb and the bedroom, if you will. I don't know how deep it goes. We cut a hole in the bedroom wall, boom, we're in. Okay, 
shits to it and it's really fast. Neighbors getting interested in what we're doing. We've obtained permission from the tenant to give us access to the Talpia department we pinpointed in the blueprints. You know, I can't, I can't believe anybody would live over Kuma anyways. It's not I don't know where it is. We've only been given two days. Over here. Come on. This is it. This is it. Yeah, this is it. Listen, we need a tape measure. That one. This is the real thing. Look at this. We're at seven feet, eight feet. Ah, some resistance, but that's not the bottom. There's more. What's blocking that? This isn't a dummy place. Bill Tarrant is our expert with probe and remote operated cameras. Even if the access hole is as small as a quarter of an inch, Bill can get a camera inside. Okay, where do you, where do you go? This, this is the video probe. Very light, and you see your face in it. Look at how clear that is. See the camera's in the tip. The lights in the tip. Yeah. We're what? gonna see, we're gonna see what it, wherever this camera's pointed. That's what, what we're gonna see. Do? What oh. can it do? It's articulating. It'll move in all directions. Yeah. That'll cool. be able to keep us in the center of the pipe so that we can actually look and Very see what cool. we're doing. Okay. Very good. So I'm gonna center it, and I'm gonna insert it into the pipe. Okay. Okay. Right. Paper's rolling. Let me take a look, so I'll watch it with you. I'll move the camera as we go down. Try to keep it in the center. See how we're going down? Still yeah. pretty clean. We're, we're moving down. We're down about 10 feet. No debris. What's that color change? It's changing color because it uh, looks like they use different color pipes when they put this thing in. How long is your camera? 25 feet. Oh, I see something. Not good. Not good. See that there? <laughs> it looks like some sticks. I see it plastic and I see some wooden pieces, uh, some debris or something. You know what, this is a pretty serious blockage you got here. No. I think people are reluctant to think that you could come upon the Jesus family tomb. Uh, and yet, there's uh, Caiaphas, the priest who uh, had Jesus crucified. His tomb was found by a bulldozer south of Jerusalem a few years ago. In December of 1990, construction workers uncovered an ancient burial cave from the first century. Inside, there were 12 ossuaries. Two of them bore the name Caiaphas. This one, the most ornate ossuary, has the inscription, Joseph, son of Caiaphas, carved into it twice. Joseph, son of Caiaphas, was the high priest of the temple who, according to the Gospels, prosecuted Jesus. From his point of view, Jesus was a dangerous, false messiah. Who was leading the Jewish masses into a confrontation with Israel's rulers in Rome. The Caiaphas ostrary was found, so it's not as though no famous, you know, you say, well, it couldn't be anybody. No matter what we find, couldn't be anybody important. Why not? It seems to me there's a double standard. You said that Caiaphas is, in all probability, the high priest who prosecuted Jesus according to the Gospels. Whereas this entire cluster is dismissed, well, this is just common Jewish names. I mean, how are you so convinced that this is the Caiaphas? You find more ossuaries in that same tomb, less fancy, with the name Caiaphas, not Joseph, son of Caiaphas, but with the name Caiaphas on it. So it's definitely the tomb, as all tombs were, of a clan. This is the tomb of the Caiaphas clan. One of them right. could have been, should have been, Joseph, son of Caiaphas, the one that we know from the New Testament. And oh. the adornment on the ossuary shows you very clearly that it is of a different standard. So, a fancy decoration no. convinces you that this is the Caiaphas no, no, of the... No. Caiaphas is not that common name. It's not a common, as common name as Jesus, Joseph, John, or Mary. It is a rare name. It's a name that we know from both Jewish sources and from the New Testament. And uh, it is 
uh, good in, in dating and timing for that period, and it could be that one. The fact is that we have never found anywhere else uh, an ossuary with the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas, anywhere else. On the other hand, you have a, a whole bunch of unique things. Yossa, which you find in this tomb, and that specific variation of the name you only find in the Gospel of Mark as a brother of Jesus, only in this tomb, no other, mm. as rare as Caiaphas. In fact, rarer, because in the Caiaphas family tomb, you found several Caiaphases. Yossa appears once, period, out of all the thousands of ossuaries that have been found. Yet nobody says, in all probability, it's probably the brother of Jesus of Nazareth. Nobody does that. The fact that the probabilities in Caiaphas are very high does not say in all certainty that this is the one. There was no inscription inside saying, I have crucified Jesus. We don't know for 100%. We never know for 100% in archaeology. But the experts do seem 100% comfortable connecting some ossuaries directly to famous names in the Gospels, as long as they steer clear of the Jesus family. At the fifth station on the Via Dolorosa, the path Jesus walked carrying his cross, we find a dedication to Simon of Cyrene. It is here that there was a moment both historic and intimate between Jesus and a man called Simon. According to the Gospels, Jesus stumbled en route to the crucifixion. And Simon, who was visiting Jerusalem from Cyrene, helped him carry his burden. Simon and his son Alexander became early followers of Jesus. Experts agree that their ossuary has been found. Strangely, it sits ignored under an archival shelf in the back of a university building. Well, we have a, a nice ossuary that was found in 1941. One of the inscriptions clearly says, uh, Alexander, son of Simon, Alexandros Simonos. That one that's clearly incised is right here, Shimon. You can see it very clearly. Right, Shimon. And apparently the chalk, which is on the other side and is essentially faded, does have the two names, Alexander at the top, Simon below, which would indicate that both of these individuals were put in this ossuary. On the lid of this ossuary, the place name Cyrene in modern Libya is inscribed. Simon of Cyrene is mentioned in the New Testament helping Jesus with his carry his cross. If scholars have generally agreed this is his bone box, this is it, then this is one of the most important artifacts in Christendom. Why is it sitting under somebody's table? Part of it is that it was found many years ago, in 1941. That was long before there were even popular magazines on biblical archaeology for the layman. So it escaped the popular attention. You have to have a publicist. You have to have somebody that says, boy, this is something. Let's put this out, right? Yeah, so uh, it ends up sitting in a storeroom. It ends up sitting in a storeroom. Maybe we'll be able to see that Char that char green charcoal, if we get the light over here on this and be able to read it this yeah. time. Okay. We need some more oh, good. Yeah, bring that over. <laughs> oh, look at this. Simka, come here. Look at this. Forget the green for a minute. Look. This is incised. Oh, my. I don't think that's published. It's not published, is it? No. It's not in any of the uh, publications. On the ossuary of Simon of Cyrene, the man who helped carry Jesus' cross, we found the same symbol that is carved over the entrance to the Telpiot tomb, the tomb that housed the ossuary inscribed, Jesus, son of Joseph. I mean, I've never heard this anywhere. Look, I'm in shock. Wow. Well, I didn't expect it. <laughs> I was trying to read the green letters. <laughs> I wasn't looking for signs of early Christianity. Signs of early Christianity. Is this a symbol that predates the cross? Is it possible 
that the symbol marking the Talpia tomb became the symbol of the Jesus movement. It is if the tomb belongs to Jesus and his family. Nothing, look, nothing. It's not so what anything we give it? Did anything move? And, uh, I think it's the plastic. I'll tell you, it's a very serious blockage. Uh, you know, we're at the point now. I think we got to call in a plumber. We're, we're gonna we're gonna break into the tomb with a plumber. You got a better idea? Itai. Yeah. We need a plumber. Now? No, nobody will come now. It's almost 9 p.m. So call him now and bring him tomorrow. This is crazy. Start with the plumber. What else we gotta do? Over 25 years ago, archaeologists discovered four ossuaries linked directly to Jesus and his family. Then, on a fifth ossuary, they uncovered another inscription. The inscription has two parts. The second part reads Mara, while the first part is a diminutive of Mariamne. And although no one had ever seen this name on an ossuary, it was translated as just another version of Mary. Mary, also known as Mara. But would it make sense to find in the Jesus family tomb two ossuaries with the name Mary? First, Maria, the name used in the Gospels to refer to the Virgin Mother. And the second, a unique spelling of both Mary and the name Mara. It might make sense if the second Mary, this Mariamne, was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene comes down to us in the New Testament as not just a name, but a name and title. According to scholars, she is Mary from Magdala, Mary Magdalene. Magdala was an important trade center close to the Sea of Galilee. The people from Magdala would have spoken Greek as well as Aramaic. Christian traditions suggest that Mary Magdalene and her brother Philip were preachers to the Greek-speaking Jews. And it's quite likely that Mary Magdalene's family and followers would have written her name in Greek. The Mariamne ossuary is the only one found in the Talpia tomb with a Greek inscription. Let's say in this very tomb of Talpia, the second Mary, right was clearly identifiable as Mary Magdalene, let's say. Right. What would you be your reaction then along with, in, inside this cluster? It would be fascinating and certainly draw much more attention and raise many more questions, but it isn't. We don't have Mary of Magdala in that tomb. If one of the ossuaries had said Mary Magdalene, I would say, wow and I would be a lot more impressed. If it will be written, Maria, Magd Maria coming from Migdal, or Maria Magdalena, I would say, very interesting. This, this power, I think if the Mary Amne inscription could be connected to Mary Magdalene, it would be more than interesting. It would be statistically compelling, because we could create a combined probability equation for the Talpiot cluster that includes Mary Amne. What happens when you do that is that the individual probability factors, even though they're not terribly small in any one particular case, when you multiply them all together, it actually starts to build up a picture that the overall thing that you've seen is actually a very rare event. Because Feuerberger takes a conservative approach, 
he eliminates Matya altogether, since he is not a known member of Jesus' immediate family. Feuerberger also divides the probability outcome by four, so as to compensate for any unintended biases in the historical data. And he further divides the number by 1,000, representing all first-century Jerusalem tombs. By the end, his model concludes that there is only one chance in 600 that the Talpiot tomb is not the Jesus family tomb, if Mariamne can be linked to Mary Magdalene. But can she? One of the most famous tales associated with Mary Magdalene is in the Gospel of John, where Jesus stops the stoning of a woman punished for adultery. But there is no indication in the text that the unnamed woman is Magdalene. It's a later Christian tradition that has linked the adulteress to Magdalene just as it has linked her to the tale in Luke of another unnamed woman specifically labeled a sinner who anoints the feet of Jesus. Drying them with her hair. Today, scholars believe that Mary Magdalene and the two unnamed women in Luke and John are all different women. The tradition of linking Mary Magdalene to these so-called sinners can be traced back to a turnaround in the church of later centuries, when women were excluded from being consecrated as religious leaders. Previous to that time, women were ordained. And in many early Christian writings, Mary Magdalene is highly respected as a missionary. I think that Mary Magdalene was an extremely important person in the Jesus movement. So important that I think, and this is my opinion, I know I'm not representing anybody else in this, but I think that she actually is the real founder of Christianity. Mary of Magdala was a major apostle on a par with Peter at the time of Jesus. But later, after the New Testament, we say she's a prostitute. So the opposition to Mary of Magdala inside the New Testament and after the New Testament is the surest proof for me that she was very, very important. The strong leadership displayed by Magdalene would have been regarded as suspect by an evolving male-dominated church. So from the second century, when church fathers began suppressing dozens of early Christian writings, the church rejected two texts that held Mary Magdalene in highest regard. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene and a text describing her brother's ministry, the Acts of Philip. For centuries, only fragments of these texts remained, and some sections had been considered lost forever. In 1974, in an ancient monastery on Mount Athos in Greece, a Harvard University professor, Francois Beauvon, uncovered a 700-year-old manuscript. It was the most complete copy ever found of the fourth century text, the Acts of Philip. In it, Beauvon claims to have discovered an early description of Mary Magdalene, unmarked by later Christian tradition. In the Acts of Philip, she is completely, there is no mention of her previous life. She is seen positively as a Christian missionary. So she is completely at the same level as male missionaries. She preaches, she teaches, she baptized, she carries even the title apostle. If in the early Christian movement, Mary Magdalene was an apostle, then the unique alias Mara on Mariamne's ossuary could be pointing to something extraordinary. In Aramaic, Mara means master. Mara, the master. Even today, if you go to the Armenian quarter, 
the uh, archbishop or one of the priests would be like Mar Samuel or Mar whatever. Lord, Master, you can still hear it. So uh, it's a sign of respect for a rabbi, for a teacher, related to the Mara, the Lord, the Master. It is clear in the Acts of Philip that Mary Magdalene is respected as a preacher, baptizer, and apostle, strong and faithful, and close to Jesus. It would make sense then for her followers to refer to her as Mara, Master. But what about the spelling of the first name in the inscription, the unique Mariamne, never found before or since on any other ossuary? In the Acts of Philip, Mary Magdalene's name is spelled M-A-R-I-A-M-N-E, Mariamne. Mariamne is the same woman as Mary of Magdala or Mary Magdalene in the Synoptic Gospels and in some non-canonical texts like the Gospel of Mary, Pistis Sophia, etc. The Acts of Philip seem to explain all the mysteries behind this inscription. But if this is really the ossuary belonging to Mary Magdalene, then there's one more thing that needs to be investigated. The common held belief, based on medieval tradition, is that after the death of Jesus, the disciples were expelled from Judea and scattered to many lands, traveling and spreading the word of God. After some time, Mary Magdalene ended up in France, where she spent the last of her days. Following this later Christian tradition, it would be impossible to discover Mary Magdalene's coffin in Telpiot, Jerusalem. However, in the Acts of Philip, written in the fourth century, the oldest known account of Mary Magdalene's travels, she does not die in France. According to the Acts of Philip, uh, at the end of the story, Mariamne is said, supposed to go home to Israel, to the Jordan Valley, and the author has an allusion that where she would die and be buried. The Acts of Philip clearly tell us that Mary Magdalene, Jesus' most trusted apostle, dies here in Jerusalem. Would it really be that implausible to find her buried beside Jesus in the tomb of the Jesus family? The statistical probabilities are compelling. The cluster of names in the Talpia tomb, extraordinary. The connections to the Gospels, too strong to dismiss. Armed with this new knowledge, our team may now be able to uncover new clues inside the Talpia tomb, if we can just get inside. Let's hook up our stuff and see what he did. Okay, sir. Let's see what we got now that we've got the plumber cleared it all out for us. This is it. I still dread the idea that maybe the blockage was the bottom of it. About 14 the feet. Here's the blockage. We're at the point now. Where yeah, the and it's not the bottom, which is good. No, we're still going. No, it's now. not this the bottom. Good. That's good. This is deep. This it is, is deep. really deep. It's 20 feet. You're already 20 feet down. You know, we're that's great. Down. Look, 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 look. Oh. That's the bottom, I think. Okay. What is that? Can you see the bottom, Phil? Either we hit another blockage, or we're at the bottom. I move the camera. Okay, what happened? To, I thought it's supposed to curve. Well, I'm gonna switch the camera. Curve. Let me pan around, see if we can find something. Can you? We don't see anything. I'm panning left. I saw. I saw. Yeah. 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 There it is. There's an opening. There's an opening. Absolutely. There it is. There it is. We're there. This what? is it. This is it. Is We're it? in the tomb. We got the tomb. Oh we got the tomb. We're right in front of the facade. <laughs> We're in. Oh my God. There it is. That's that, that's, the that's, the, that's the tomb. That's wait, not wait, wait a minute. Oh my it's a God. Where is it? You know what? That's not, the, that's not the entrance to the tomb. We're in the tomb. 
You're in the no, tomb. No, yes, absolutely. Mushroom and consider. That's the it's the tomb. All right, here. This is this is one sec. It's the tomb, man. We got the tomb. We found our tomb. But where's the gable, Itai? You know the gable, the the, 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 the yeah, yes, Well, I think that's it, isn't it? There, is that a, an ossuary? Wait, wait, that's ossuaries. Those are ossuaries. Yes. Yes. Oh my goodness. There's good news and there's bad news here. There's an ossuary there. Well. What does that mean? Well, it means we're in the wrong tomb. Our tomb is empty. So, what are we gonna do? It's the wrong we're tomb. We're in the wrong tomb, man. Right? You know what? What? This may be the second tomb. You're right. The, this the, may be the, other the one we thought was 20 meters north. We're in the second tomb. Right. Our tomb is 20 meters south of here. The good news is no one's ever been seen a, a tomb from the time of Jesus in, in pristine condition. Although we found ourselves in the wrong tomb, perhaps these finely crafted ossuaries, so close to the Talpiot tomb, are somehow connected to Jesus or his followers. Hey. So what's next? We gotta find the tomb. The holy family tomb. You gotta be looking 20 meters south. It's gonna be on the other side of this building. This way. Where are you going? Where the fuck are you going? <laughs> south, that's the parking lot. Shouldn't be a big deal. South is south. 20 meters takes us in the garden. 20 meters is not much. We're okay. In 1980, the IAA catalogued four of the ten ossuaries from the Talpia tomb as bearing no names. But these ossuaries were far from plain. Several displayed ornamental rosettes on their sides. And on the rear panel of the ossuary catalogued 80-506, they found a large cross mark. OK, look at this. Look at it, Felix some kind of a mark. It looks like a cross to me. It looks like a cross. But this cross mark was immediately dismissed as a mason's mark. It is theorized that mason marks were scratched onto ossuaries by the coffin carvers as signatures, or marks indicating how lids should be aligned to boxes. This one has nothing to do with Christianity. It's just a scratch. It's very common. It's just a sign of the Mason, I believe. Who and wanted. that's because well, crosses Mr. simply Mr. aren't Mr. accepted as crosses. I produced it sense. and it belongs to me. On any archaeological remains Maybe it was dating even before, before the fourth century. The, the, The common belief among archaeologists and historians is that there is almost no archaeological evidence of early Christianity until the fourth century, 300 years after the death of Jesus. This is when the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great legalized Christianity, essentially allowing an underground movement acceptance into general civil society. Its popularity exploded across the empire, and Constantine became known as the first Christian emperor. But it's hard to believe that an early Christian movement, strong enough to last 300 years of persecution and then sweep the Roman Empire, would have left no archaeological evidence of its existence before its legalization. You know what? I noticed on the corner of my eye yeah. a cross inside a circle. What is that? That's great. I, I love that question because this is not a cross. This is four centuries before the cross was established as a Christian symbol. This is a rosette, the most common design on ossuaries of the first century. Other ossuaries have also crosses on them. 
but there are masons' marks to fit the placement of the lid to the box itself. To prove the point that the cross was used as a Christian symbol in the first century, you need much more evidence than one poorly executed rosette. Today, the cross is immediately associated with crucifixion. But that is a reference that would have been horrific during the years directly following Jesus' death. For anyone in the first century to wear a cross around their neck would like someone today wearing a little electric chair. It was disgusting. It was a symbol of torture. And it was only when crucifixion was stopped that the human imagination was able to move from the reality to the symbol. But perhaps people did use crosses as religious symbols at the time of Jesus. Crosses that had nothing to do with crucifixion. In the Bible, uh, Ezekiel, there's a place where uh, God says, go to the city and put, like we would say, an X or a cross on the forehead of all the righteous people. Before this is a cross, people are doing X's or crosses, but they're not thinking of Jesus, the cross, at all. What they're thinking of is it's the end, the idea of finalizing, right? Stamp, sealed, delivered. And it took on an apocalyptic meaning then. It, the last letter means that you're sealed up, that you're finished, that you're okay, that you're waiting maybe for the resurrection. You know, let's mark the people that are prepared with the X or the Tav. The Tav, the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet, or Tau in Aramaic. In the book of Revelation, Jesus declares, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letters in the Greek alphabet. Jesus would have declared, I am the Aleph and the Tau, as he spoke in Aramaic. And in his time, the symbol Tau was drawn as a cross. On the ossuary marked Jesus, son of Joseph, directly before the name Jesus is a deliberate inscription of a Tau. That cross is absolutely part of the original inscription. It's the same depth and style of the inscription, plus the mineral vaporization, clearly going deep into all the letters. If this symbol, this Tau, was a mark of righteousness at the time of Jesus, it may very well have been adopted by his earliest followers. Centuries later, it would evolve into the Christian cross. It's a terrible thing when a culture is wiped out. And yet, you know, there's a sense in, what, in which that's happened to Jesus and his followers. And that sounds very shocking. Somebody says, what, Jesus and his followers? They became Christianity, they're not wiped out. But that original movement, the way they originally were as Jews right here in this area, believing in their own version of the Jewish faith, but also following Jesus, that sort of disappeared. And I think it's disappeared for theological reasons, even though I think the material evidence is around, if we'll just open our eyes and see it. Could it be that there was a movement made up of Jews who saw Jesus as their Messiah, not their God? And because this movement largely disappeared from history, we are blind to the archaeological evidence they've left behind. If there is evidence for this movement of Judeo-Christians, the logical place to look for it is here. According to tradition, this is the view Jesus had when he walked up the Mount of Olives and gazed upon the Jewish holy temple. Where the Muslim gold dome of the rock now stands was once the Holy of Holies. There the Ark of the Covenant was housed. According to Luke, Jesus looked at the temple foresaw its destruction, and wept. Where he wept is here, Dominus Flevit, a holy site on which Franciscan monks built this monastery in 1891. This spot would have been the perfect place for a Judeo-Christian cemetery, overlooking the temple they were sure 
Jesus would come back to rebuild. That's good. In 1953, while renovating, the Franciscans discovered a 2,000-year-old cemetery. This ancient necropolis was partially excavated by a well-known archaeologist named Bellarmino Bugatti. Bugatti claimed that these ossuaries belonged to some of the earliest followers of Jesus. If this is a early Judeo-Christian cemetery, then that means that our tomb is not sitting in some kind of archaeological vacuum. It's really part of a network of cemeteries. This can provide an archaeological context for our tomb. In this network of tombs, the Franciscans discovered a bone box with an inscription naming one of the most famous early Christians, Simon bar Yona. Now, I don't know if everybody will recognize that immediately, but Jesus said to Simon Peter, who's venerated later as the Pope and the head of the church, you are Simon bar Jonah, blessed are you, Peter. See, his name is not Peter, that's a Greek word. His name is Shimon, Shimon bar Yonah. Today, only a piece of the ossuary remains. The Franciscans have stored it in a small museum beside their church. It bears an indisputable inscription, the only one ever found spelling the name Simon bar -Yona. Simon was one of the 12 original apostles of Jesus. According to the Gospels, Jesus renamed him Peter, in Aramaic, Kepha, which means rock. He's considered a saint by many Christians and the first pope by the Roman Catholic Church. According to tradition, Simon Peter was crucified and buried in Rome. So how could his coffin be here in Jerusalem? The fact is there has never been any credible archaeological evidence found in Rome underneath the Vatican that points to Simon bar Yona. And here sits an ossuary discovered at Dominus Flevit bearing his name. So if this is a Judeo-Christian necropolis, it is part of a network of cemeteries and tombs that belong to the early followers of Jesus, including Jesus' family. OK, you're not going to believe this. What? You're not going to believe this. I'm imagining it. Can you see? No, I see it. It's a, it's a symbol. Symbol from the from the tomb on an ossuary. This is incredible because the angle and, and, and the thing is identical. It's identical. And the dot inside. And the dot is deliberately inside. The inverted V with a dot in the middle, the symbol from our tomb, right on an ossuary from what is suspected an early cemetery of the followers of Jesus. To find this symbol displayed on an ossuary here, in the necropolis of Dominus Flevit, directly connects it to what is believed to be some of the earliest evidence of Christianity, as to who may have been buried in this ossuary, and whether or not he knew the Simon of Cyrene who displays the same markings on his bone box, or the Jesus son of Joseph whose tomb has been emblazoned with the same symbol, we can only speculate. When it comes to forensics, modern science doesn't allow for much speculation. By studying ancient DNA in bone fragments and human residue left behind in ossuaries, scientists can now determine familial relationships between the various people in the Talpia tomb. Stephen Fan is the director of the Center for the Study of Early Christianity, and he's assisting Stephen Cox a forensic archaeologist from New York State. They have discovered valuable material inside the ossuaries inscribed Mariamne and Jesus, son of Joseph. 
Inside this ossuary, we've got some material that's adhering to the surface of the stone in a uh, very interesting circular pattern. Uh, it's worthy of picking out and taking, uh, taking a look at it and see what its composition is. The pattern and or material could give us a big clue as to who, what, when, and where. It seems outlandish that these samples might contain the DNA of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. But if there's enough material, these tests may shed a new light on Jesus and his family. So this is sample 80-500. The samples have been numbered and sent to this DNA lab in Thunder Bay, Canada one of only five labs in the world that specializes in ancient DNA. The scientists don't know that the samples belong to a Jesus son of Joseph and a woman who might be Mary Magdalene. If these bone samples truly do belong to Mary Magdalene and Jesus of Nazareth, we would expect the tests to show that they are not genetically related. We would expect to find DNA representing two individuals with no familial ties. And that would be an extremely rare discovery in a family tomb. Unless the individuals were husband and wife. OK, so we received the samples that you sent up. And uh, when we first examined them, they, they didn't look very good, very dry, very desiccated, very small and very fragmentary. And so for that reason, it was going to be very difficult for us to do the analysis. We then went on to process or start to process the samples and try to understand the quality of the DNA. Is it going to be viable for analysis? Uh, in this particular case, we found the DNA was fairly degraded, fairly damaged. And for that reason, it limits what type of work we can, can do. The question now, is there enough DNA material to create a significant profile? To obtain the maximum amount of information, the biologists will try to recover what they call nuclear DNA from the bone cells. The extraction analysis showed that nuclear DNA was very difficult to recover. We have then focused on the mitochondrial DNA, the mitochondrial DNA being inherited from mother to child and maternally inherited means that we can only identify those types of relationships. The bone material is too degraded to recover DNA from the nucleus of the cells. And so the DNA extraction is now focused on the bone cells mitochondria. Mitochondrial DNA can only tell us whether or not Jesus, son of Joseph, had the same mother as Mary Amne, whether or not they were brother and sister. If the biologists cannot recover mitochondrial DNA from the bone cells, the test will have to be aborted and we will never know the true relationship between Jesus and Mary Amne. We have indeed been able to achieve results. We got the mitochondrial DNA. It was very fragmented, very small amounts of DNA. We were able to amplify it, we were able to sequence it. We then went on to clone those sequenced DNA fragments, and by cloning the DNA, we were able to then compare many, many copies together. And that increases the validity of the work, and that way we're able to compare the sequences between that one individual and the other individual. And that's essentially what we've done. And I can show you the results here today. OK, so what we have here is we have two sequences, just representative sequences, one from each individual. And what I'm going to show to you here is some of the variations between the two individuals. And so we have a polymorphism here, this G and the A. A polymorphism is a variation between 
uh, this sequence and another sequence or a variation between this sequence and the reference sequence. We use a polymorphism to indicate or identify a mitochondrial profile. And this polymorphism shows one difference between the, the two individuals. We also have another polymorphism here where we have a T and a C showing another polymorphism difference. So we have a number of polymorphisms that show differences between the two sequences. We can then conclude that these two individuals, they're not related, or at least not maternally related. They do not share the same mother. It can't be mother and child. It can't be brother and sister. So for these particular samples, because they've come from the same tomb and we suspect it to be a familial tomb, um, these two individuals, if they were unrelated, would most likely be husband and wife. For centuries, people have speculated on Mary Magdalene's relationship to Jesus. Mary Magdalene appears with more frequency than other women in the canonical gospels, always a close follower of Jesus. Her presence at the crucifixion and Jesus' tomb is consistent with the role of a grieving wife and widow. And so perhaps Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married, as the DNA results from the Talpiot ossuaries suggest. Perhaps their union was kept secret to protect a potential dynasty. A secret hidden through the ages. A secret we may be able to uncover in the Jesus family tomb. We've finally been able to contact one of the original builders of the Talpiot apartments. Ephraim remembers the tomb, but is a little hazy on its exact location. It's between the two buildings? OK, he says it's right between these two buildings. Let's try. Between the apartment complexes is a large garden with high terraces. And it's in this area that Ephraim states the tomb is located. But on which terrace is the question? The neighbors begin to take an interest in the search and point out an inconspicuous cement slab on the lower terrace. Could it be under the cement thing? Ephraim explains that the slab has no structural purpose, but he's interrupted by an almost prophetic visit from a blind woman who's lived in the apartments since their construction. One million percent certainty. That's all we needed. If we could remove this inconspicuous cement slab, we just might find ourselves staring into the entrance of the Jesus family tomb.
Okay, now how do we do this? We need everybody to help, right? Felix, you realize we're rolling a big stone. No, no, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. It's unbelievable. This is it. Nice. Okay, okay. Okay. It's the real thing. I mean, I'm pinching myself. I can't believe it. Okay, come on, come on, come on. Take the picture and compare, man. Watch your first step. It's okay. All right. Sorry, I can't see anything. As long as I can see the dense scorpion. One step is in this area. No, just spiders. No, it's scorpion. No, this is definitely it. Look, there's the chevron. It's beautiful. It's just gorgeous. This is it. Look. Just like in the book. Just like in the picture. Look at it. Felix, we found it. We actually found it. I'm going in. Okay, let's go in. The opening of the tomb, 26 years after it was found, coincides with another twist in the story. One of the Talpiot ossuaries has disappeared. Counting these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we have ten ossuaries here. Each. Um, but the visits to the Bet Shemesh warehouse have turned up a strange error in the records. I went to the, the storerooms of the Israel Antiquities Authority in Bet Shemesh. They provided me with this computer sheet, which indicates that from this tomb, there are nine items. It says it quite clearly, number of items, nine. And it has the description of uh, these, these osheries and where they're located in the storerooms. Somehow, somewhere, one of the Talpiot ossuaries went missing. And it is with this missing ossuary that a new mystery begins. Perhaps the ossuary was stolen. Maybe a worker at the site in 1980 had light fingers. Ossuaries can fetch fairly high prices in the antiquities market. And in October 2002, a chalky limestone ossuary surfaced from a private collection. It bore the inscription, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Oded Golan, a well-known collector, stated that he had bought the ossuary from an Arab antiquities dealer in the old city of Jerusalem decades before, but had been unaware of the significance of the inscription. It was among the first ossuaries that I have in my collection. I didn't put any special attention uh, to this ossuary because the three names which are mentioned on the ossuary, which are Yaakov, uh, Yosef and Yeshu, Yeshua, are a very common name um, in the first century. And therefore, I couldn't even think uh, that it could belong to the family of Jesus. And at the same time, I never knew that Jesus had a brother or siblings uh, of any kind. After Jesus' death, his brother James took over his ministry and gathered a large following as the undisputed leader of the Jesus movement. Later Christian writings tell us that he was respected by early Christians as well as the Jewish Pharisees. And first century Jewish historian Josephus spends more time on James than on Jesus. But just like his brother Jesus, it was fear of his religious popularity and influence that led to his death. In what was widely viewed as an act of judicial murder, the temple high priest, Ananus, condemned James and had him executed in Jerusalem by stoning. The 
The numerous accounts of James's life show an early Christian of such importance that if it was at all possible, he would most certainly have been laid beside Jesus in death. It wasn't until 2002 that a highly credited scholar viewed Oded Golan's collection and suggested that the James ossuary might belong to the family of Jesus of Nazareth. And so began what is now a famous controversy, a battle of scholars and science over the authenticity of the James ossuary. The James ossuary, where did it come from? The collector who owned it, Oded Galan, well publicized, says he got it around 1980. Sometimes he said before or after, but hey, around 1980. Our tomb was discovered in 1980. There's a missing ossuary. The Israeli antiquities can't find it. Now, maybe they'll find it in the back of a warehouse, but I checked the dimensions. I was just curious. The missing ossuary was cataloged. It's just gone. The dimensions of that ossuary are the same as the James ossuary. Now, a lot of people have concluded, experts, that the James ossuary is a forgery, but nobody says it's all a forgery. And the position now of the Israel Antiquities Authority is that it originally said James, son of Joseph. I would be fine with that. I mean, you think about it. We've got these six names. If the James, son of Joseph, forget brother of Jesus. See what the ossuary says, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Some people say, well, the brother of Jesus, maybe that was added. It wouldn't matter. Obviously, it'd be the brother of Jesus. You got a Jesus, a Joseph, a James, son of Joseph, if it were from this tomb. Now, we're speculating, but the time is right, the name is right, and that, I think, would really make it fairly clear that this is a Jesus family. But what would it take to determine whether the James ossuary originated in the Telpiot tomb? The date and the recorded dimensions are extremely suggestive, but it's the patina that should prove the case one way or another. Over time, in a tomb, minerals and sediment accumulate on ossuaries. This accumulation is called patina, and it can be scientifically analyzed to produce a chemical and mineral fingerprint specific to an ossuary or tomb. Every ossuary discovered in a particular tomb will have the same patina fingerprint. The samples taken from the James ossuary show certain trace materials such as titanium and iron that are unique to the James ossuary. If the James patina matches the ossuaries from the Talpiot tomb, it will be strong evidence that the James ossuary is the missing bone box and belongs to the family of Jesus. Dr. Charles Pellegrino has come to the Beth Shemesh warehouse in Israel to collect patina samples from the Talpiot tomb ossuaries. I can get a lot of the debris from here. Charlie, that's patina. That would be good. Yeah. Yes, excellent. This is 8503, the inscription of Jesus, son of Joseph. It's just one of those moments where you're struck to a kind of silence, uh, knowing that you're holding the chemical history from the ossuary that may actually have contained the remains of Jesus of Nazareth. At Dr. Pellegrino's request, we commissioned the collection of random patina samples to determine whether the Talpia tomb patina is really distinct. This most patina, that is plenty mm. for Charlie to work That's in on the, on the electron microscope. It's interesting. If the random samples do not match the Talpia ossuaries, yeah. while the James samples do, then the statistical probabilities that the Jesus family tomb has been found will be overwhelming. If it were possible to obtain evidence that the James ossuary might be this missing ossuary, then this would have a very strong additional degree of uh, evidentiary value. Um, I would say that that would be an absolute slam dunk 
if that were in fact shown to be the case. The Suffolk Crime Lab is a leading American CSI lab involved in solving modern day crime mysteries. Today, it will use its forensic expertise to determine how the patina from the James ossuary and the patina from the random samples compare to the Talpiot ossuaries. Did you see that piece? Yes. It had sort of like that tunnel running through it? Yes. Do you want to take another sample out of this uh, container, uh, or is that sufficient? Yeah, I think that's enough. All right. Yeah, I think that'll do. Yeah, mount it just as is. So that piece will be good to look at. But right now, we're just uh, taking other samples of the accretion from inside the ossuary. Iron is part of the signature that gives the soil that distinctive color. We now have it from this tomb. We have it from the ossuaries from this tomb. We're just taking other samples, and we're going to look at them under the scanning electron microscope and ping them with the electron microprobe. looking at here now is the spectrum of the patina sample that we just analyzed. This is predominantly a limestone material, correct, Charlie? Yeah. It's what's called the Jerusalem chalk. It's a very soft limestone. Uh, but what I find interesting is the small trace materials that we are locating here, as opposed to the general limestone properties that you would expect to find. We're noticing iron, titanium, potassium, phosphorus, magnesium. So far, the uh, elemental composition that we analyzed with this particular section of patina is consistent with the trace materials that we found in the James Ossuary. The signature is the same. It matches. The patina samples from the Talpia tomb match with the James Ossuary. But what about the random samples? As it turns out, None of them match Talpiot. The same chemical and mineral spikes as that of the Talpiot tomb are exhibited only by the James patina. This is key evidence, indicating that the ossuary inscribed James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, is the missing ossuary from the Talpiot tomb. When the James ossuary is included in our statistical model, the probability factor changes from 600 to one in favor of the tomb to 30,000 to one, strongly suggesting that this tomb belonged to the family of Jesus of Nazareth. One, two, three, these niches, the Kochim. Two here, two here, two here, exactly. Six all in all. Look, two death niches where you lay out the body. Jesus' body, Mary's body would have been there. Look at this. And then look over here, eh? This is it. This is absolutely a jewel of a tomb. Look at that, it's pretty deep, man. Yeah, those Kochim are very deep. I didn't realize that. Look at that, Felix. What is that? There's an incision. There's an inscription here. This is Greek. That's Look, an M? See? That's an N. Greek N. N. Is it N or M? M. And what's this? We need an epigrapher in here. This is old. Two, three, four, five, six letters. It's either Greek or Latin, but certainly not Hebrew. Looking around, we noticed that we were sitting on mounds of decomposing pages of scripture. What is that? Shine that down? Shine it down? Look at that, Felix. This is, this is full of holy books. Disintegrating holy books. 
According to Jewish law, biblical books cannot be discarded. They have to be buried like humans. It seems that in the weeks following the removal of the ossuaries and before the tomb was resealed, a local rabbinical school filled the tomb with damaged holy texts. Among them, we found a book that Jesus refers to as the key to his ministry. It's the book of Jonah. Jesus says in the gospel, if you want to know, his apostles say, what are you up to, master? And he says, you want to know what I'm up to? Read the book of Jonah. That's, that's the code. And right here, I got the book of Jonah. The Gospels record that Jesus constantly spoke in parables and codes. Not surprising for a leader of what today would be labeled an anti-government movement, a man destined for crucifixion. And those who speak in codes often harbor great secrets. During the rushed excavations in 1980, archaeologists removed from the Talpia tomb the last ossuary with an inscription. The ossuary belonged to a child. At the IAA Rockefeller Museum, the inscription was translated, Yehuda bar Yeshua. Yes, Yehuda bar Yeshua comes into English as Judah, son of Jesus. Judah, son of Jesus. The New Testament doesn't say that Jesus had a son, but perhaps in this instance, archeology span forces us to throw a different light on the New Testament. Could this bone box have once held the remains of the son of Jesus and Mary Magdalene? If Judah was their son, his existence would most certainly have been kept secret. Since Jesus was perceived to be a pretender to the royal throne, Jesus' son would have been a target of arrest and crucifixion by Roman authorities. It was a time of great persecution. Anyone associated with Jesus' ministry was threatened. His cousin, John the Baptist, beheaded. James, the brother of Jesus, stoned to death. Simon, another brother, crucified. If they were parents, Jesus and Mary would have known that leaking knowledge of the birth of their child would have put the child at terrible risk. So perhaps the unnamed beloved disciple referred to in the book of John is actually the son of Jesus. Who remains unnamed in the text to conceal the child's lineage. In John 19, 26, Jesus asks the beloved disciple at the base of the cross to behold his mother. He then says to Mary, Emma. Woman. Behold your son. Traditionally, this scene has been understood as Jesus addressing Mary, his mother. But can this be later theology? Could it be that Jesus was talking to Mary Magdalene, his wife, asking her to protect their son? On the other hand, maybe the fact that there was a son in the Talpia tomb means that the Jesus found in this tomb is not Jesus of Nazareth. Accordingly, we would have to believe that living around the same time, in the same place, there was another Jesus who also had a father named Joseph and two close male relatives named James and Yose, and two women in his life, one called Maria and 
the other Mariamne. What's that noise? I think they're getting upset they weren't here. I'll go, I'll go talk. One of the tenants in the Talpia apartments works for the Israel Antiquities Authority. And even though we have permission from the tenant board, she's called in the IAA. It was the Talpia department owners who, out of concern for their children's safety, arranged for this tomb to be sealed. A tomb that the IAA had left open in 1980. Obtaining permission from the IAA to open a tomb they never sealed seems unnecessary. But despite our pleas, we were asked to cover it again. Okay, תמשיכו, לסגור, רק לסגור, לא לפתוח. The tomb that arguably once held the remains of Mary, the mother of Jesus, Matthew from Mary's family line, Jose and James, the brothers of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, her husband Jesus, and Judah, their son, is sealed up again. Who knows what secrets are still inside and for how long they will be kept hidden under the Talpiot apartments. <laughs>